We have quite a number of folks registered for this presentation and we are gonna get started and they can join us in progress. So, uh, so good evening, everyone. <laughs> and welcome to the Book Club of California's online program titled, We Are Not Animals, Indigenous Politics of Survival, Rebellion and Reconstitution in 19th Century California. This is a live online presentation by author and historian, Martin Rizzo Martinez. Now, my name is Kevin Kosick, and I'm the executive director of the Book Club of California. And it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight and host this webinar. As I said, uh, we have a lot of people registered for this event. We have more than 170 people who've registered for this presentation. So for those of you who might be new to us, the Book Club of California is a nonprofit member and donor supported organization that is dedicated to preserving and promoting the history of the book and the book arts. Oftentimes we do that with a particular focus on the literature and history of California and the West. Now the book club publishes limited edition books, a scholarly journal and keepsakes. We host a year round series of exhibitions and programs like the one this evening on topics including fine printing, design, typography, book binding, collecting, California history, and much, much more. Now, if you're not a book club member, or if your membership has lapsed, and you're really interested in what we do, please consider joining our century-long tradition. Our membership dues are modest, but the benefits are many, and we simply can't do the work of the book club without the support of our members. So I encourage you to visit our website at bccbooks.org to join or to donate to the Book Club of California. And now for tonight's program, and our presenter. Again, the program's titled, We Are Not Animals, Indigenous Politics of Survival, Rebellion, and Reconstitution in 19th Century California. It's a live online presentation by author and historian Martin Rizzo Martinez. Now, Martin Rizzo Martinez received his PhD in history from UC Santa Cruz. He now works for the California State Parks as the historian and the tribal liaison for the Santa Cruz district. In addition to working on a second book, Martin is also a co-producer of a podcast entitled Challenging Colonialism and is producing a documentary a film entitled Walk for the Ancestors about a native family that walked from mission to mission in 2015 to honor their ancestors and protest the canonization of Junipero Serra. So his book, we Are Net Animals, Indigenous Politics of Survival, Rebellion, and Reconstitution in 19th Century California was published in early 2022. Now, by examining historical records and drawing on oral histories and the work of anthropologists, archeologists, ecologists, and psychologists, We Are Not Animals sets out to answer questions regarding who the indigenous people in the Santa Cruz region were and how they survived through the 19th century. Between 1770 and 1900, the linguistically and culturally diverse Ohlone and Yokuts tribe adapted to and expressed themselves politically and culturally through three distinct colonial encounters with Spain, Mexico, and the United States. In the book, We Are Not Animals, um, Art Speaker traces tribal, familial, and kinship networks through the mission's chancery registry uh, records to reveal stories of individuals and families and shows how ethnic and tribal differences and politics shaped strategies of survival within the diverse population that came to live in Mission Santa Cruz. Now, if you have any questions for our presenter or comments, you can use the chat and the Q&A functions in Zoom. We should have time at the top of the hour to take questions and we'll curate those from the chat and the Q&A. So now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Martin Rizzo Martinez, and pass over the controls for tonight's webinar. Martin, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, I really appreciate the introduction uh, and the opportunity to present here for the Book Club of California. Um, I wanna start by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you tonight from my home in Santa Cruz, uh, which is the ancestral homelands of the Uipi people near the village site of Aulintak. Uh, these lands today are stewarded by the Amamutsan tribal band, uh, who are the closest ancestral neighbors to the Awaswa-speaking Uipi people who lived here. 
I want to start by clarifying that my work as a historian is no substitute for listening to Indigenous peoples today uh, who are able to speak from the lived experiences about the history, which I will share some uh, in my book. So it is my hope that my work will help direct people to listen to, to learn from, uh, and to work in collaboration with contemporary Indigenous communities. My book helps illuminate important historical context in early colonial California, uh, and can help us better understand and appreciate the strength, resiliency, and ingenuity of Indigenous Californians historically and today. Now, like many of us, or probably most of us here today, uh, I too am living on lands that are not those of my ancestors, uh, which is why I feel it is about this history and to support those same Indigenous communities on whose lands we get to benefit by living here today. Um, my own interests and questions that drive my research, uh, the questions I ask, uh, really come from my own family's long history in colonial New Mexico. Um, now, before I get into some of the stories I'm going to share from my book, uh, along those lines, like I was just mentioning, I just want to point out a couple other books that are uh, very important out there. Um, for those who might be interested in the histories that I talk about in the Santa Cruz area, uh, I think it's really important to check out uh, the book, what's well, on my left here, uh, Bad Indians by Deborah Miranda. And Miranda is a member of the Ohlone Kosnoan Esalen Nation, uh, which is based out of Monterey, not too far from where I am today. And in her book, Bad Indians, uh, is a tribal and family memoir. Um, so again, like I was saying, I think uh, when you're able to actually hear firsthand from people who have uh, lived experience of this history, uh, I think that there's, it's really crucial that we listen to those. Um, there's other great works out here too. I just highlighted a couple in this image, but uh, if you haven't read, I wanna encourage people to check out um, Greg Saris's new book, Becoming Story. Uh, as well as uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Sim Schneider, in his book, The Archaeology of Refuge and Course, which is an amazing study of how the Coast Miwok State uh, continued to kind of exist outside of the missions. Really important stuff. Um, okay, so uh, before we get into the stories from my book, I want to give a little bit of context to talk about. Uh, my book details the history of indigenous people of the greater Santa Cruz region uh, from before the arrival of Spanish colonists up through about 1900. Uh, one of the themes that my book uh, focuses on is that indigenous peoples of the greater San Francisco Bay Area were interconnected through longstanding ties and interrelationships. By the time the Spanish arrived in California in 1769, they encountered a highly sophisticated and complex indigenous society. While the Spanish failed to recognize this complexity, it is important to recognize that this complex society was interconnected through a diversity of economic, social, political, and spiritual ties uh, throughout the greater region and throughout California. And this complexity did not disappear through the disruption and violence of the Spanish colonial era and the ensuing uh, eras after that, uh, even with the introduction of the missions. Uh, a lot of studies tend to assume that um, that those ties ended at that point. But my work focuses on how indigenous resistance and ways in which native people challenged and fought back against colonial control. And the stories that I'll share today will demonstrate how strategies and tactics of resistance transcended uh, geographies and tribal lines. Now, my approach to doing this work has been to uh, center on oral histories whenever possible. Um, but this includes oral histories recorded from the late 1800s, uh, ethnographic interviews that took place in the early 1900s. Uh, as well, uh, I also worked closely with uh, local tribal members today. Uh, in particular, I worked with a couple members of the Alamutsin Tribal Band, uh, including uh, Tribal Chair Valentin Lopez, as well as, and probably most crucially, uh, Alamutsin Tribal Historian Ed Ketchum. Uh, and those who read the book will see, I quote, uh, catch him uh, quite a bit and include a lot of the stories that he, he shared with me. Uh, what I found, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this also includes uh, working closely with the archival documents such as the mission chancery records. And this is the baptismal and burial marriage records at the missions. Uh, and while these records were written with Spanish hands, I argued that they constitute an indigenous archive themselves. Uh, the, the information was written into the books, um, but it was informed by Native people who told them what to write in there. And there's all sorts of little information that we can find there. 
And what I found by doing this research is that even in the colonial archives, it is possible to find the voices of and the perspectives of indigenous peoples uh, when reading against the grain. And I'm gonna share some, some of these stories and some of my methodologies uh, with you tonight. This map, by the way, in the background is kind of a map of the larger indigenous region of the Monterey Bay, uh, including with village sites in different tribes throughout there. Um, this map here that I'm showing you uh, is a map that was was designed, I helped design it, um, but it was made at the request of the Alma Woodson Tribal Chair, Valentin Lopez. Uh, and he suggested, uh, he wanted to see if we could make a map that would show the specific tribes and communities that were taken eventually to Mission Santa Cruz. Uh, and I think it really is an important one because it helps to show how wide ranging the impact of the missions were. Uh, were. Uh, a lot of times people think that the missions just impacted the native communities right in that area. Um, Santa Cruz is kind of the northern part of this bay. Uh, and I'll just point out, um, these were the tribes that were made up the majority of people eventually that were taken to the mission. Um, but the first range of uh, tribes kind of uh, going out to the Chiloctaca and the Aptos, there were, were all spoke the language of the Waswas. Uh, Ohlone language. Uh, the people on the other side of the hill, or really the Matalan, Unahima, Ausaima, those people were also Ohlone, but they spoke the Mutsun language. And then once you go past the Lakobo on this map here, and those tribes out there, we're in the San Joaquin Valley, and those were the tribes who are known as the Yokuts. And I think this is important. I might reference some of these names later in this, um, but I also want to point out the diversity of different tribes, the different languages that were spoken in the missions, the different uh, communities, different families. Um, there was a, a wide range of people who were kind of thrust into these mission situations and trying to make sense out of this. Um, so in order to understand the communities that were impacted at Mission Santa Cruz or any of the missions, uh, and maps like these could be made for uh, any of the missions really in California, uh, but it's essential to center uh, beyond the missions and to really consider tribal kinship and other indigenous networks and connections uh, and how those networks extended far beyond the missions themselves. Um, so, uh, you know, one of these, uh, in many cases, uh, tribes and even families were divided and sent to different missions. Uh, and this was often done as a way of subverting power from some of the more powerful tribes uh, in the area or families that had a lot of influence. But these kinship ties that transcended the mission boundaries continued through the mission years and beyond. And researchers are now recognizing the ways in which people communicated across geographic space, and they continued with trade of traditional goods and resources or exchange ideas uh, and other strategies across those lines. Um, and I'll give you again some examples of these when I get into the specific stories. Uh, there's one other, uh, a couple other points, quick points of uh, context that I want to give, because I think it's really important to understand before we talk about some of the stories within uh, these spaces, uh, it's important to understand that the missions themselves were devastating spaces of great loss and trauma. Um, this is a, a chart I did um, when I was helping out, I mentioned that uh, uh, Kevin mentioned a family that I'm helping to document their stories they went through, but they asked me to look up the baptismal and burial records at each of the missions, um, which is what I have put together in this chart here. And this is information that's out there in the public, although I kind of traced through uh, to kind of uh, make sure I could, you know, correct these numbers. But what I want to show you and emphasize here is that uh, I highlighted Santa Cruz and San Juan Batista, which are the missions where the Alma Mutsun tribal band that I work closest with uh, descends from. And what you can see here is that there, the number of uh, the column on the left is the baptisms and the column on the right is the burials, right? And this traces through the beginning of the missions uh, up to the closing. I think that I stopped at 1835 here, which is kind of around when the missions were secularizing and people were being emancipated from it. Um, but the takeaway, and I think the, uh, the crucial point here that I'm trying to make is that over 90% of the people baptized at Mission Santa Cruz uh, had died by the time the mission closed in a span of just uh, uh, just under 50 years. Uh, and a little less time at San Juan Batista, uh, but the numbers were uh, equally uh, very difficult, right? Over 85% of the people coming in there. And even when you take into account people who might've died of natural causes over that time period had the missions not been there, uh, those numbers are devastating. When you look at the 35 or so different tribes that came into Mission Santa Cruz, for example, 
Um, you have to understand that this is a space where people were, were losing kinship uh, members, they were losing family members, wives, children, uh, at an alarming rate uh, that was regular. Uh, in fact, the population uh, relative uh, stable, stability of the numbers, if you looked at each mission over across the years, is only because as people are dying, new groups were being brought into the missions, which gives it this, this sense of uh, somewhat stability. But I think it's, it's really crucial to understand that. And moreover, uh, I looked at the, the children, native children who were born at Mission Santa Cruz between 1791 and 1831. And there is just under 500 uh, total children that were born there. And when I looked at uh, the infant mortality numbers of this, um, what I found was that over 50% of those children did not make it to the age of one, were either stillborn or died in infancy. Uh, and then over 25% of those who had survived that didn't make it to age five, which means that over 75% uh, of the babies, children born at the mission did not survive past uh, childhood, five years old. And just to give a little context, because I did look at the archeological records throughout the Bay Area of grave sites and cemeteries so that we can get a sense of what was the pre-contact mort infant mortality numbers. Uh, and this is all well documented in the book, but what I found is almost the inverse. It was about, when I looked at thousands of burials uh, that we have records for, it was about 80% um, that were surviving into adulthood to the age of 16 or 17 uh, as they correlated those. So. Uh, the impact of the missions, again, is, is just a devastating one. Um, but there's a lot more to this story than just loss. Uh, and I'm going to give you some of these stories. And in my book is filled with stories and examples of ways that people kind of persevered through this. Um, in 1812, the main uh, Padre at Mission Santa Cruz was a young man named Padres Andres Quintana. And he was known for being sadistic and for his harsh beatings. Um, in fact, he had just fashioned a whip in 1812 uh, that had been fitted with wire or iron tips so that it would cut deeper when he was punishing people. In the fall of 1812, after Quintana had beat two young men nearly to death, a group of around 20 men and women gathered together to discuss what to do about this sadistic padre. And they ultimately decided that they needed to assassinate this brutal priest. We know about the details of this event from the oral histories of a fellow named Lorenzo Asisada. Uh, he was born at Mission Santa Cruz. His father had been one of the conspirators uh, involved with this. So he was able to share his, uh, his ver version of this, the oral history of this, when he was interviewed in the 1870s by one of Bancroft's uh, historians. I worked a lot with this oral history and I traced out the stories of all of the individuals that he mentions or discuss or refer to in this account. Uh, and this led me to a much deeper understanding of the events of the assassination. And that's some of the detail that I'll share with you. So this close examination revealed that there was a woman at the center of this story uh, named Yakenensat. Um, she was baptized and renamed as Fausta, and that was the common practice at the missions. They were baptized and given Spanish names. Um, and Yakenensai played a, a really key role in this story. Um, now, I should note that Asisada never mentions her by name. Uh, he only referred to her as the wife of Julian. Uh, and so I had to kind of trace out and figure out who was this woman. And as I did, I found a lot of details that really uh, made me realize what an important figure she was. She was likely uh, a leader in her community, the Sumu um, people. You can see here the area of the Tumoy and Sumu, uh, which is over by Pacheco Pass area. Um, and she was probably a spiritual leader within the tribe. Um, now I'll give you a little bit of details about Yakenensai because her story is fascinating. Um, but she was uh, born in 18, I'm sorry, she arrived at Mission Santa Cruz in 1807 uh, with a group of, full, uh, of the uh, 50 other Sumu members. Um, she was married to uh, a fellow named Laka, or baptized as Julian, who had been a Akalde, so he was a leader within uh, the mission community already. When she arrived, she was listed prominently, and the listings of the individuals often reflected social standing. Women were typically listed later, um, and yet Yakenetsa was listed right after the chief and his family, so it shows that she had particular standing. Uh, and in the records, uh, in one particular record, there's a note there that she was a monja, uh, which is only two women who are noted as this. A monja translates uh, into the Spanish to mean nun, uh, which of course she wasn't a Catholic nun coming in here, but it, it clearly kind of denoted some kind of standing there. 
Now, in the story that uh, Asa Sadiq gives, uh, he credits uh, Yekhenetsa with some really key parts of this. Um, first of all, he credits her with uh, developing the plan to kill Quintana. So she's the one who comes up with the strategy to do it. Uh, and the strategy basically involved um, calling uh, to, uh, she was supposed to call the, um, the priest, Padre Quintana, to administer last rites to her husband who had been sick. And so when he was to come administer last rites, a group of young men were supposed to attack and basically kill the priest uh, and do this. So what happened on the night of this is that Yekhenetsat did summon Padre Quintana to the side of her um, her husband. I should note he was the gardener too. And so they lived kind of in the middle of the plaza there uh, or in the middle of the mission area. And so um, when he was exposed, they, the group did not attack him the first time. And so um, she had to go summon him again to administer last rites. Uh, and they, again, did not cut, carry through on this. So uh, according to the oral history that Asasada gives, he says that she actually threatened the, the men and said, hey, if you do not carry through on this this last time, I'm going to reveal what happened, and then he's going to find out what's going on. So that last time, uh, they do actually carry through in this. Uh, but as you can see, she plays this really crucial role of coming up with the plan, and she's at the center of this whole story. But... Be to really understand, and this is where the example I'm going to give you of uh, the way that these tactics and stuff have been communi across, communicated across communities, um, I want to take you back to before this, right? So we'll come back to the assassination of Quintana because there's a lot more to talk about there. Um, but I want to take you back a couple of years to 1803, I'm sorry, 1805 over at Mission San Jose, uh, which is over the hill a little ways away. Um, at Mission uh, San Jose was a padre named Padre Pedro de la Cueva. And Cueva had a similar reputation to Quintana, right? He had a reputation, this guy, for drinking and for violence um, in multiple ways, right? Different accounts. Um, and at one point, he was basically asked to perform last rites on a baptized villager who was living over in a village. Um, and he, he was supposed to go administer the rites because this guy was dying. He was brought there by a group of scouts uh, to this village, and it turns out he was brought to the wrong village, right? Um, and they speculated afterwards whether that was done on purpose, uh, part of an ambush or something else. Uh, but in any quick case, his group was ambushed. Um, there was a, a Spanish soldier who was killed. Uh, who was actually the first Spanish soldier who was killed by Native people in the Bay Area. Uh, De La Cueva himself was shot with an arrow in the eye. Um, he did survive it, though, um, and he was pretty quickly after that sent back down to Mexico, where stories continued to come out where he would be threatening his other padres with knives and with violence and getting drunk, too. So that continued. But the important part about this I want to emphasize is that Notice that the strategy was the same thing, right? They were calling him out to administer last rites. Now, where this took place uh, was in 1805. And remember again that Ikenetsad arrived in 1807. So she would have been living in her village back in the Sumo territory. But this situation took place about maybe 50 miles north of that. So there's no doubt to me that she would have heard about this. The story of this attack and how they had done that would have reverberated around. People would have learned about it. Um, but I think that there's... Another element to this too that's worth digging into, and that's about the uh, the issue of last rites and funereal practices. Uh, and I think if we delve into that, we can understand a little bit more here. So for Bay Area indigenous people, funereal ceremonies were rituals of social cohesion, right? They brought people together as funerals, right? Often do for pretty much any society, right? But in indigenous society, the Bay Area, tribes and families, were often affiliated with a particular animal helper, right? They would be bear clan or deer clan, right? Different, uh, have different affinities. Now, anthropologists refer to these as moieties. Um, and basically with, when it came to funerals, what would happen is members of a different moiety would help take care of the funeral arrangements for the other group, right? It allowed a particular family and kinship network to be able to grieve, right? And to be able to, uh, you know, feel what they needed to feel and the other people take care of this. But this, of course, builds interconnectivity, right? It builds community. It's a way of taking care of each other. Now, when the Catholics arrive uh, in, with the missions, they imposed um, their particular practices, right? Catholics had a last rites. And so at the missions, they would insist that they would have to do this. So questions arise around this. Was this a strategy that was first developed uh, as a protest to this imposition of Catholic funereal rites? Um, or was it 
due to them recognizing uh, a way to get the Padres exposed, right? Do they realize that by asking them to do this, the Padres would not miss the opportunity to go, uh, you know, impose their their uh, their last rights, and so that would be a way to get them uh, unsuspecting, right? Um, so we don't exactly know, but what we do know is that clearly Nick Cannon saw it, learned from what was going on uh, and was able to import a, a strategy from kind of the Eastern Bay Area down into the mission situation here and use it to, um, to take care of this abusive priest. Now, coming back to the story um, in the assassination of Quintana, uh, I want to uh, dig into a couple more stories here. Um, first of all, I want to point out that when I looked at who was involved and who was arrested for this, I found that that almost everyone, the only exception was Yekenensa, but the rest of the people involved in this all came from the very local, close Awaswa speaking Ohlone tribes, um, which at the point, I have a little population figure here, but the Awaswas at that point formed the minority. They were under 20% of the overall population. Um, and I found this interesting and I was trying to figure out why, what was going on, what was uh, the background, what were some of the stories there. So what happened to the people arrested? There were nine men who were arrested. And I should note too that no women were arrested, including a Kenansa. So in some ways her uh, Spanish patriarchy maybe prevented them from recognizing that she could be involved and she was able to kind of stay out of their gaze when they eventually did arrest the people for this. Um, but moving from Yakinitsa's story to look a little bit at another uh, prominent figure in this whole story, um, I want to bring attention to a young man named Lino. And I talk a little bit more about his story too. But I, I want to point out that Lino was an uh, 18 year old. He was the youngest, uh, I'm sorry, he was the oldest uh, child that had been born at the mission at the time of the assassination. Uh, and as such, he held a particular prominent place. He was the personal page to Padre Quintana. Even the Spanish accounts say that when the Quintana had beaten him quite a bit, right? So he's at the center of the story and a lot of the oral history goes around him. Uh, his father is also one of the men arrested is Ules or Andres Ca uh, Cañizares. Uh, his uncle was also arrested amongst these nine men. And when I looked at the group here, they, it was basically an expanded kinship network. They were from multiple tribes, but they all had very close uh, family ties and intermarriages to Lino and his family. So he was really uh, at the center of this. So I want to talk a little bit about Lino, but in doing so, I want to talk a little bit about the title of the book, uh, We Are Not Animals, which comes from uh, the, this very oral history and this story. Um, so I mentioned earlier that this, this oral history, the accounts of this assassination come from Lorenzo Asisada, uh, whose father was involved with this. Um, but the quote itself is actually attributed by Asisada to this young man, Lino. Um, and this came from that meeting where they had, where they were trying to figure out uh, what should they do about the Padre. And Asisada kind of quotes, you know, gives uh, stories about what, what these people were saying, right? And so this is the quote here. Uh, attributed to the 18 year old young Lino, right? And he says, the first thing that we need to do is to keep the Padre from having the desire to punish people in such a manner, for we are not animals. He tells us in his sermon that God does not command this type of punishment in his example or in his doctrine. Now, Lino, I should know, is the personal page. He knows the, the, the prayers, right? He knows his teachings very closely. So he says, tell me then, what are we to do with the Padre? Run him off? We cannot do, nor can we take him before a judge, since we do not know who commands him to do what he does, right? He doesn't know a process of appeal above the church authorities. Uh, it'll be better than if we kill the Padre without anyone knowing about it. Um, so in this story, a couple things, you know, Lino recognized that Quintana has overstepped his boundaries, has failed to follow his own teachings. Um, there's a hypocrisy here. Uh, Lino also grasped that the mission system does not allow for them to take him before a judge. Um, so they're only left with one alternative here, right, if they're going to stop him. But I think what I want to analyze here is that that moment where he stops and he says, we are not animals, because I think it's really, uh, there's a lot of layers that we could unpack to this particular statement. What exactly is he meaning by this, right? And I think to understand that, we want to look really quickly at what do animals mean to indigenous peoples, and what did animals mean for Spanish society. So for indigenous peoples, their world was, was based on a relationship and interrelationship. And a lot of it had to do with the natural world and animals around them. Um, there were spiritual connections with animals. Um, 
animals visited native peoples in their dreams to bring them messages, um, bring them power or knowledge. Um, animals were also in places. Um, I put up this map. There's a lot of village sites that we know translate to mean places. Santa Cruz was Aulintak, which means the suffix talk in these languages meant the place of. Santa Cruz is the place of the red abalone. Uh, Watsonville is a place called Tiyuvta, which meant the place of the Tuli elk. Um, there was Ipitak, which is the place of the rattlesnake, or Orestak, which is the place of the bear. And so animals played a prominent role in just the world around them, right? Even the village sites. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, there were family affiliations with certain animals, bear clan, deer clan, things like this, right? So animals had a very uh, important relationship, right? It was, a really, it was a relationship of connection with this. So when he says, we are not animals, right? It kind of makes you wonder, well, what is he exactly meaning in this, right? It's a different way. So let's transition and think, what did animals mean for Spanish society? So when the Spanish arrived, they brought with them their own crops and agricultural products that they planted on, uh, on existing fields of uh, native grasses and resources, but they also brought livestock, right, which had a huge environmental impact. Um, they brought with them pig, cattle, horses, mules, chicken, right, farm animals that they brought up there. Um, and of course, though they had their own relationships with these. Um, the ways that the, the Spanish related to them were actually hold on on this uh, was through bondage, right? Through control, right? Controlling the the work that they were doing. They were beasts of burden in many ways. So the Spanish brought with them instruments to control the animals, uh, yokes to uh, put on the the cattle, right? Uh, goads to drive livestock in the direction that they wanted them to go, right? And I should also point out that it was the native people who were doing this. They were the drovers. They were the ones who were managing the livestock. So they were put in charge of them, right? Um, so they would have had a very close realization of how animals were treated there, right? Um, and of course, they would have seen similarities to the way that they were treated uh, within this. Now, within when it comes to the missions, there's a lot of debates. How can we understand these? Were they penal systems? Were they concentration camps? Or were they idyllic uh, spaces, benign spaces of, of uh, teachings. Um, I argue uh, in my book and elsewhere that the best way to understand uh, what the missions were for Native people at the time um, is to, to recognize that Native people understood them and complained uh, that they were being treated as livestock, that it was a dehumanizing process. Um, so the Padres didn't see them as human, or at least um, they said they didn't. Of course, now they're focusing on spiritual conquest, which acknowledges their humanity. But in their actions, uh, which is what the Native people would have been experiencing, they would have seen the comparisons, the stocks to hold them, right, the whips to punish them, uh, kind of the same uh, type of thing, right, this dehumanizing process that goes. Um, and Native people were treated, uh, according to the oral histories, much more along the lines of animal husbandry, right? There's stories in uh, Asasada's account, too, where he talks about um, when a couple weren't able to have children, uh, the, the padre basically um, inspected their bodies and, uh, you know, did all these things. It, it's really uh, scarily reminiscent of, you know, the types of animal husbandry practices they had. There was a dehumanizing element to what was going on there. So when Lino says, we are not animals, right, he's coming uh, from a society where relationships and interrelationships between people and animals and the world around them, um, what is it that he's really meaning, right? He's referring to the beatings and the whippings. Uh, and these are not indigenous practices that his people had, right? But these are how the Spanish have taught uh, them to treat these other animals that are coming into the area. So ultimately, when Lino asserts that we are not animals, it's a rejection of the treatment uh, that they are experiencing at the missions um, and a, a rejection of the dehumanizing treatment uh, from people like Quintana and other Padres. I saw it a little bit quicker than I expected. I was trying to make sure I didn't go too long. But that's, Kevin, I come to the end of that, although I could certainly Happy to go explain more. <laughs> I'm here. I was listening here, to every, every single word, taking some notes. Um, you want to talk what's on your last slide? You want to just share? Sure. Happy to share. Uh, I For those who are interested in the book, um, 
the Friends of Santa Cruz State Parks uh, has very generously uh, offered to sell it for wholesale. So 40% off of the, the uh, kind of cover price. Um, so there's a link there. Uh, for people who want to uh, check that out. And again, this was this comes from really uh, just a, a part of one of my chapters, uh, third chapter there. Um, the other thing I'm linking here too is, uh, as mentioned in the introduction, I, along with other work, I'm co-producing a podcast um, called Challenging Colonialism, where we interview Native California people today about various, all sorts of different issues. Every episode kind of shifts to different things. Um, there's not a lot of me in it uh, narrating other than the editing, but it's it's really an opportunity to hear from Native California people about all sorts of different uh, interesting things. So I want to invite people to check that out. That's available on most podcast platforms that are out there. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I'll, I'll take down that uh, that URL and I'll send it out to everybody who's here and even the folks who didn't weren't able to attend. So they have that uh, discounted offer. I had the link, a couple of people have messaged me for the link for the book, and I was about to send them to the, the University of Nebraska page, uh, University of Nebraska press page, but I won't. I'll send them here instead. <laughs> um, and now, so now everyone is your chance to uh, to hit the, the chat or the Q&A if you have any comments or questions uh, that you want to pose uh, to Martin to, about, about the book. I will say that um, thank you for this, and uh, and thank you for the story, which I think I wasn't sure you were going to tell the whole story about the title of the book and where it comes from and and the quote. Um, and I love that it also kind of led into the demonstrating the interconnectivity of the, the tribes and um, and animals and wildlife and how that all kind of was a different uh, whole different mindset, a whole different thing for the indigenous people versus the the Spanish. So uh, thanks for elaborating on that. I know there's much more in the book and if people want to check it out, um, they can, uh, they should. Um, so, thank, so thanks for that. I'll just say thanks and give people a chance to put some stuff. There's a cue and here's some stuff going into. Yes, uh, contact information for you. I have uh, your website that I can send people to and I'll put that in the email that goes out Tomorrow, if you want to tell people uh, your website right now, they can take that. Sure. Down. Yeah, my website is is my last name, Rizzo Martinez, without the hyphen. Um, and if people want to email me, you can also email me. The best way to reach me is uh, M-R-I-Z-Z-O at UCSC.edu. Um, the one I have through UCSC. Parks deletes emails after a couple of months, so I, it's hard to keep track of things. <laughs> Great, and uh, I, I can actually just get that real fast and, and post it in the in the chat as well. Uh, oh, somebody put the link. There's your website for everyone who wants that as well. So we do have some, I'm gonna read some of the, the Q&A uh, questions or some of the comments. And the first one is um, from Rose Marie. She says, what is the, the Native American population in Santa Cruz County today? What does it look like down there today? Well, you know, there's, it's complex these days, right? So in California, California has the largest uh, population of Native, Native Americans of any state, right? But part of that has to do with kind of a history uh, getting back to the 50s of like relocation programs where Native people from all over the country often went, were sent to families, were sent to places like Los Angeles, San Francisco, Oakland, where these centers were. And so a lot of the Native communities that are in California, in Santa Cruz, in the Bay Area, um, actually trace back, right, maybe a couple generations more recently. So it's a little different from Native Californian um, populations. But to answer that question, uh, unfortunately, the numbers at Mission Santa Cruz is one of the worst. And there were very few families that survived. There was um, less than 100 about 10 years after the close of the mission. And by 1900, there was just a handful of families. Um, the Alma Woodson do uh, trace back to families, mostly at San Juan Batista, but they do have some connections there. Um, but, and I do think that there are families out there who are not as visible, but there's very few who trace back to Mission Santa Cruz uh, from the Owasso Salona peoples. And so the population in Santa Cruz these days is very low. There, the Alma Woodson people have ties there, but most of them, uh, I mean, it's really expensive to live in Santa Cruz, uh, and most, uh, you know, most of the Alma Woodson folks live uh, in other places a couple hours away, uh, kind of far away from there. So, you know, this is one of the issues around the lack of uh, federal recognition for families and, you know, folks who made, who survived the missions. It's also connected to, um, 
you know, lack of any kind of lands or reservation lands. Um, you know, there's there's a family that uh, is close by who does have some lands at Indian Canyon, right, and uh, Canyon Sayers. But uh, but most most Native people from the larger region uh, don't have access to lands and stuff, and so they're kind of spread all out. Mm. So yeah. There's a, a, a great uh, comment in, in the Q&A that I'm going to read for you. It's a little long, so bear with me, unless you want to pull it up. But I'll read it so everybody knows what we're talking about. Uh, Johanna says, uh, it's fantastic lecture, and you made so clear uh, what the asymmetries of perception about animals was. You know, would you be willing to expand on the asymmetries of understanding of hierarchy and authority? The indigenous people probably did not see authority hierarchy in the same way as the Spanish as per your story and the role of the woman who instigated the murder. Any any thoughts on this? Anything you want to share about that? Sure. Yeah, I think it's important to know. And I think that the, the story you kind of saw is a great example of this. But, you know, the the way um, Spanish had a patriarchal system, right? Women had certain roles. Uh, now, indigenous peoples had, you know, gender roles uh, that, you know, men did this work and women did this work, although there were exceptions and there were third gender and there was other uh, people who varied there. But uh, as far as political and spiritual leadership, women were sometimes in those roles. So uh, it was often men, but not always. And sometimes it would get handed down to a sister after a chief died or something like this. And there's examples of women who did have those powers. So I think that uh, one of the things I argue in there is that that, you know, that was a transition, that was a big change, right, to move into the mission systems, um, all of a sudden women were not allowed the same avenues to power that they would have been allowed beforehand, right, so there was an imposition of um, kind of these gendered hierarchies as well. Um, for Bay Area Native people, um, uh, you know, and there's there's some great works out there, uh, you know, that people have done on this over the years, but um, that wasn't as uh, rigid in the hierarchies. There were chiefs, um, but and there were people, you know, who had kind of, you know, political power. Um, but they, you know, they were they only had power in certain times, right? It, they weren't controlling people's lives. So the idea of hierarchy, I mean, it definitely was a much more family-oriented thing. I mean, even tribes like in the area of Santa Cruz, it's like they they would rotate villages seasonally. So they had like a system where they would kind of move around, and sometimes you know the family networks would kind of move out into different areas. So it was a, a very different, uh, yeah, way of way of being in so many so many levels. There's there's also uh, there's another great question in here, and I know a lot of people, I know I'm I'm thinking this too, so I'm going to ask it. Um, you know what what different processes were there for the natives to be taken into the missions? Like when a mission was established, did it work like the the later schools where usually the young people were you know pretty much just ushered in there, kidnapped, um, or were they offered services like food and healthcare and other things like that? How did that work, and how did they bring them in? Yeah, that's a that's a really big question, and and I'll reference. Uh, there's a, a great book written maybe 20 years ago now. Um, gosh, by the late Randy Milliken, uh, late great. Um, but he he addressed that question in a book called The Time of Little Choice, right? And what he argues, and he looks at the very early stages of this, right? When we know that um, the Spanish military was not a force to be reckoned with, right? They were very small compared to the uh, villages and stuff. And he tried to address that, like, why did they go into them if the missions were so difficult? And what he found is a good uh, argument is that it was a combination of factors. There was um, a, like a, a curiosity to find out who were these people here and what were they bringing. So children were brought in first often. What they didn't realize is that Padre said, once you're baptized, you can't leave the mission. The children have to stay here because now we're spot responsible for instructing them. And so that created a relocation over geographically, right? And if you have a tribe that's got maybe 200 people or 170 people, and all of a sudden you have 30, 40 people who now have to live at the missions because their children are there, um, there's a impact to the society, right? It becomes difficult for those tribes to be able to maintain their, their practices and do everything. This impacts the trade uh, relations, right? All of a sudden they're not able to trade the things and all this. So there's a social impact, but there's a political impact as chiefs start seeing, well, wait a minute, my members are going into the mission and that other chiefs in there, I'm going to lose any kind of you know political powers that I have. So that happens too. So it's a whole bunch of these. The ecologic impact is huge. I mentioned the impact from the livestock that are transforming these foods. So all of a sudden people can't get foods. At Mission Santa Cruz, when I analyzed what months people came in, it was the winter months. Uh, the majorities would come in. So starvation played a factor in it as well. So there's a whole bunch of them. But I should note that what I found, so Randy Milliken's work is great, but he stopped his study about 1800, 1805. 
And what I found is after that, as the local tribes had all been relocated, or most of them had been relocated into the missions, they started, uh, the Spanish start looking out towards San Joaquin Valley to the Yokuts. And the stories that come around those reveal a much more violent process. At that point, the Spanish military is a force. Uh, and, uh, and I should note, there were some tribes that fought back. The al Saima, there's certain tribes that led rebellions and fought back. So it wasn't uncontested, um, but there's a much more military engagement at that point. And the oral histories uh, account for this, right? They talk about some of the violence that's involved with removing um, people, wholesale villages, right? There's a letter that I see with a padre who's celebrating. He says, they're bringing back a whole village. They brought all of them, even the blinds, you know, even the sick. Uh, they brought everyone back here and he's celebrating. He says, you know, oh yes, rejoice. You know, they've brought all these people back, but there are fugitives, they've run away, right? They clearly, they don't want to be back there. There's a reason they ran away, yeah. So uh, there's some other questions in here, but I have to ask the question about why were so many of the Padres just terrible people? Why were they, I mean, drunkards, right? Violent, like how, how was, the, how did that happen? <laughs> well, you know, I, I, it's, it's really who we focus on, right? I think the story that's been around for the last hundred and something years has been of the benevolent Padres, right? That the Padres were, the, the narrative that I often hear that people say is that the Padres are the ones helping, the soldiers were the ones, right? The Hunapur Sura story, right? It's about that. Um, and there, it really comes down to individuals, right? There were probably some who were probably trying to protect them from soldiers at some points. But what I found in my research when I look at Mission Santa Cruz is that it's not just Quintana, right? There's also Padre Obes who does some terrible stuff and Tabuada who's passing syphilis to the native women who are in the mission, right? And so, uh, and then, you know, the later guy, Jimeno, uh, who comes over from Monterey, who's, uh, you know, accused in some other accounts of raping a woman over in Monterey. So there are I think it's 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 a mixed bag, right? And it's these people are being sent up here. I mean, we want to think about the situation. The the image I had of the Padres too when I first started doing the research, I kind of imagined them to all be 75 year old men who are kind of wandering around and and that's not the case. And then you think about it, it's like, oh, of course not. They're sending them up to this the periphery of the Spanish frontier, uh, up in California. They're coming from Spain uh, or Mallorca or these islands, and they're coming over. They're training for a year at the Colegio de San Fernando in Mexico City, and then they're being sent up here. Um, and they're usually 25-year-old men uh, for the most part, 25, 30-year-old men. And all of a sudden, they're put in charge of, at some missions, a thousand people, right? Um, Santa Cruz is a little smaller, 350 people. But all of a sudden, they're they're by themselves. There isn't a lot of oversight. There's a Padre Presidente who comes and visits, uh, visits every once in a while to check in. But for the most part, they're kind of, they're the people who are running this whole thing. So is it that surprising that, you know, if you get a collection of, of 25-year-old men and put them in charge of uh, give them a lot of power over a lot of other people. I mean, some of them are going to be take advantage of that power and do some awful things. Let, uh, let's let's talk a little bit about the the research for the book. You mentioned a number of times about the oral histories. Um, a couple of the like the Bancroft has certain certain things that you were tell us about your process and where you went and and how this kind of all came together. Sure. Yeah. You know the. I, did a lot of research a lot of places. Uh, I spent some months down in Mexico City. Um, there's a huge archive, the National Archive, the AGN down there, uh, which is really a fascinating place. It's built in the old um, prison uh, from the 1890s, right? It's the, uh, this really, really interesting kind of place with its own history. But um, I spent months there kind of going through all the records there. Um, I spent a lot of time uh, Santa Barbara, right? The Santa Barbara Mission Archive Library, uh, which is an amazing resource with so much, um, so many documents. But that's, you know, probably a big place where most of the letters uh, through that whole kind of colonial period were. Uh, I spent some time up in uh, Sacramento going through the state archives, uh, and then a lot of time in Monterey at the Archdiocese uh, with the wonderful Father Carl, who's, who is just really great to work with. Um, and uh, and I, again, I think the, the biggest thing Really, and then I, I should say, I spent a lot of time with the Harrington field notes. So J.P. Harrington uh, was an ethnographer who in uh, the, the early 1900s uh, did a lot of interviews. And uh, on this particular one, I, I worked a lot with, uh, he spent a good year uh, interviewing uh, Maria Ascension Solorzano, who was uh, one of the Amamutsen um, ancestors. She passed away in 1930, uh, the last fluent Mutsen speaker. And there's thousands and thousands of pages at the Smithsonian. Um, a lot of it's digitized now, which is 
great. Um, and I should give credit, you know, the, I went through the, the baptismal records and, and there's all sorts of uh, wild stuff in there. I mean, you find certain names that are given where it's like the names are actually, you know, it's a certain, for example, I'll give one example, but there's one uh, chief in there who kind of um, ends up uh, gaining control over some of the other native people. And his name is there. Uh, it matches the name of coyote in their language, right? And coyote, of course, the trickster. And so there's these layers where you could read into this and say, well, who's informing that? Is that really what he said? Or is that what the other said? No, he's coyote. Put him down as coyote. You know, so you can see these layers of information that's in these documents. But those those registries from the, the baptisms have been digitized by uh, Steve Hackle and the folks at Huntington. Uh, and there's an online database where you can get all these records, which wasn't always the case. 30, 40 years ago, you had Randy Milliken and John Johnson, these two kind of, you know, prominent researchers back in the day who went, you know, to each place, they're writing all this stuff down. So because all that stuff is available, I was able to kind of synthesize it, put it into my own databases and really start tracing out family ties and connections. Um, which is what allowed me to get such a close view of some of these folks and to kind of connect and figure out what their stories were. It's inc incredible the level of detail and record keeping that is available that you've kind of put together to share some of these you know, stories and, and what happened. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. The, there, there's a question about the image on the cover of the book. Um, and you yeah. didn't really talk about that. Is there a story behind that illustration or that image that you want to yeah. share? Yeah, you know, that's an illustration of an actual photo. On the, I have the photo in the book inside uh, with the images in there, the figures. That is a fellow, uh, his native name was Eirachis, and he was baptized and given the name of uh, Justiniano Rojas. Um, and there's a later chapter, uh, like I said, it, my whole book spans into about 1900, but the chapter in the American era in the 1850s and 60s uh, talks a lot about him and his story. Um, this image was actually, uh, so there's a photo, a couple photos, two photos taken of him um, in the 1870s. He died in 1874, so shortly before he died. And there's a whole romanticized story that came out around this same person. They accidentally, they they mistakenly looked up his, uh, to see how old he was. Uh, and they saw a similar name from somebody much earlier. And they said, oh, he's 122 years old. And so this whole myth of uh, kind of these ancient Indians starts getting propagated, uh, not just there, but every city in, you know, pretty much in California has this, you know, certain old Gabriel, right? 120 year old, 130 year old. And this idea, um, and it was partly used to kind of boost tourism in California, right? It became like, come to California, the Indians lived to be 120 years old, right? The water is so clean out here type of thing. But his image actually, a portrait is made uh, and sent to the Vatican. And then another portrait is put on display at the Chicago World's Fair in 1893, right? The, the big famous one. Um, and so, uh, and stories of him are sent in, in newspapers in Australia and everything. So there's this whole kind of, um, you know, awareness, and it's all after he's he's died. He doesn't know anything about this, right? But um, this kind of mythologizing of him. Uh, but I trace out what his real story was. Who was he really? I was able to figure it out and figure out that his his real story is actually much more interesting than the fantastical one that they came up mm -hmm. with. Yeah. So your your book and your research goes up to like nineteen hundred, right? Mostly. What what mm -hmm. happened? What what's the state of the indigenous peoples now? Um, how are they yeah. treated by the government and, and communities and our lang you know, there's a specific question about what languages are still being, you know, spoken, if any, for all of these tribes. Yeah, well, I, you know, I work very closely, you know, um, I'm the tribal liaison for uh, Santa Cruz County um, State Park, so I work very closely with tribal partners here. Uh, probably the closest I work with is the Amamutsen uh, tribal band, and, uh, you know, they're working right really hard right now to relearn the Mutsin language. Um, I mentioned uh, Solar Sano and she was the last fluent speaker. We have, uh, fortunately, she left so much of the language. And so um, they're actually working right now. I think they have a plan, I don't remember exactly, but to kind of bring back um, the Mutsin language into their kind of uh, tribal meetings, uh, you know, over the next little bit of time. So they're all trying to relearn it. Um, and they are uh, just working hard to steward land. So we work as parks, uh, state parks right now. We have um, um, MOU working with uh, the, uh, the Alamutsen Land Trust 
um, to manage some of the lands just north of Santa Cruz here. Uh, and I know that's happening across California to certain degrees, right, where we're starting to, um, you know, learn, realize and recognize, appreciate just the, the level of sophistication of um, indigenous land management practices, right? We've had these terrible wildfires and we've prohibited uh, controlled burns for the last 200 years. So now we're, we're starting to get to a point where we're, um, and we need to do more of this, right? But learn to manage the lands in a way, you have to realize that, you know, people who lived on these lands and developed over thousands of years, right? The right way to live uh, and, and kind of make the most of the environment. And we come in here in the last 200 years and, you know, look at the devastation of what's happened ecologically, right? To the environment. So there's ways right now, I think that luckily, you know, there's a lot of people interested, obviously, you know, attending this and other talks, I think that there's a, a big interest right now, which I think is great. Uh, I think there's still a long way to go um, for a lot of different things. Um, I know, you know, there's some projects trying to bring back some of the indigenous names. Um, I'm working with some tribal members right now. There's uh, Fremont Peak, and Fremont has a, a terrible legacy of, of, you know, massacring uh, thousands of, of Native people over time. And Fremont Peak was called Toyotak, which means the place of the bumblebee. Um, which is a, a much nicer name. And so there's a movement to try to see, can we bring back some of these native names? Can we bring back um, that awareness, right? Of the environment and of that history and of the native people who are here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there's that, yeah. They, I, I live in Alameda and the, uh, one of our local parks was just re renamed as well for, for the same reason, like Jackson Park no longer exists, right? It's Chicheno Park now, um, which is great. Uh, yeah. And, and um, well, that just reminds me to ask a question because uh, I, I, we don't do it often here uh, at the book club, but you did it at the start of, of the talk is you did a land acknowledgement, uh, which I love when that happens because it really reminds us all of how important uh, th this whole thing is. Um, tell, what, what, what are your thoughts on land acknowledgements and are they helpful? Or is it making a difference? What, what do you think about that? Yeah. You know, that's a good question. And we're dealing with a lot with them at state parks. We actually are on a statewide level, right? The Tribal Affairs Office, which we have some really wonderful, uh, particularly Native Californian uh, folks who are working in the tribal affairs who are just doing great stuff, uh, like Sabine and Maya. But um, we we are kind of looking at that. We're trying to, you know, bring uh, land acknowledgements into parks. And I think it's really important. I think, you know, I grew up in LA. I grew up in San Fernando Valley. And I learned nothing about Native history growing up uh, at all. And I, you know, my mom still lives in like Topanga and it's named after a Native village site. And I didn't know that until much later. And, you know, now I, I have, you know, friends who are Tataviam from the tribe where I grew up, but I, I had no awareness of that. And I think things like land acknowledgements are great in that sense. It reminds people that there is a history here that goes far beyond the missions uh, and goes beyond that, right? There are people here. Um, I think it's it's most important to know that there are still people here today, right, who are uh, fighting for their rights, and I think that's crucial. There's a critique of land acknowledgments that they they could be performative, right? It could be kind of a, a thing to check, a box to check, and just do it. Um, and you know that's a fair critique too. I think uh, you know it's you know people say well you know we need to go beyond that, right? And I'm all in favor. I think that you know I think history. Obviously, I love history. I'm a historian. Like I. I think it's really important, but I think, you know, we live in places, it's it's so nice to know and understand like the deeper levels of that history. And, and so much of it has been unfortunately hidden, right? I think there's an erasure of indigenous history in California that's that's profound, right? I mean, we, I think all of us who've grown up in California, maybe with some few exceptions of people recently, but most of us have, have really did, learned very little, right? We've kind of lost out on the opportunity to better understand the place we are and and the people around us and in these histories. So I think they're great. I think that, you know, people yeah. should include those. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, sounds cheesy, but it starts with awareness, right? If you're not aware of the land that you're sitting on and how it became the land you were sitting on and who was here before you, it's hard to do as what Barbara says in, in the chat, like how can you suggest how we begin to live in these places that were not ours, that were taken from others kind of thing? Yeah, you know, I mean, that's a great question. I think I'll I'll go back to the thing I was starting with, but I think the the most important people thing, the most important thing people can do is, you know, learn when I teach, right, and have a class, I'll have my students do assignments where I'll say, you know, like do some research, like whose lands do you grow up on? Like when you think of your home, like 
whose lands are those, right? What is the history of those lands? Where are those people today, most crucially, right? Uh, are they able to live on those lands? Or like in Santa Cruz, have most of them not have been priced out of there, right? They can't. Um, and so I think that once you kind of do that research and, and find out and seek out that, then I think most importantly, like, you know, what are, what is going on for the tribes whose lands you're living on and how can you help them, right? How can you see what's important to them uh, and what are the, the work that they're doing that you can assist in, right? Is there, is there ways to uh, contribute in some way, whether that's getting information out or going to their talks and uh, kind of listening to the issues that are important to them. But I think, you know, we throw around these ideas that decolonize things and um, I think these are all great things, but I think it really starts with, with recognizing and acknowledging the people who are here today uh, and trying to, you know, find out, seek out what are, what is important to them, right? What are, what are some of the things that you can do to get involved? In this area, I'll bring it back. Uh, there's a, a sacred site uh, in Gilroy that's called Eurostock, and it's where, it's a place where for thousands of years, uh, spiritual leaders came together from different tribes and had the cook suey ceremony, which is this really crucial kind of pan-tribal ceremony that brought people together. And right now it's being under threat to be turned into a gravel and sand pit, um, which we have no shortage of. We have thousands of those all over. Uh, and so that's a movement that the Alan Woodson are fighting for is to uh, try to protect it. There's a petition out there and they're asking people to write letters to Gilroy. Uh, if you go to protecteurostock.org, um, you can see there, I think they just extended the deadline for feedback on the environmental impact report. So that's one thing you can do, uh, depending on where you live. I'm sure that there's there's many situations like that all up and down the state. Yeah, there's a perfect timing because Naomi just put it in the chat um, that your, your land acknowledgement at the beginning was one of the best that they've heard uh, in terms of naming the, the local uh, pre-mission group in the village and the larger language group. Uh, and then, of course, referencing those books, I think that was great, too, to just kind of give people more information of where they can go to find out more. You, we're, we're at the top of the hour, but there are a couple of questions I didn't want to get to. And one was um, your thoughts on you at the top of the program, you talked about you know, firsthand lived experience of, of these folks um, and where and that's important to get. And so where can someone like me or one of our you know participants go to get more of those firsthand lived experience stories to get immersed in what's happening. Yeah, you know, it's, this is a, going back to the question too, what somebody was asking, like, you know, what is the climate like today? You know, I think we're, we're fortunate that there are a lot of uh, Native Californian uh, community members and scholars, especially young scholars. I mean, there's a ton of uh, really brilliant young Native Californian scholars who are exploring all sorts of different topics. And um, books that are coming out. So there's there are quite a few great books. I mentioned a couple of them um, there, but that's just kind of the the tip of the iceberg. I think there's there's a lot more stuff out there. Um, so I think it's just a matter of kind of searching for it, checking out you know different talks. And I think um, you know I, I think that there's there's a lot going on, which is which I'm really happy to see. I think there's you know fortunately more and more interest. I think you know, personally, like teaching classes, I think after Standing Rock, uh, I think that that shifted things. I think there became, I think a lot of people came back from that and said, well, wait a minute, what's going on here? Which I think is great and really important. So I think, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of that. Yeah. I see somebody says, check out the tribe's websites. Absolutely. Like it's, you know, it's a digital age. Like, you know, I'm sure if not every, I mean, pretty close to every tribe uh, has their own websites. You can go to uh, it is the uh, NAHC, Native American Heritage Commission, which is a governmental or, uh, run organization, but they work with the tribes and they have pages for each of the tribes that links to their uh, websites and has information there. So that's one way uh, to do it, where you can kind of do a little little internet research and kind of track down those things. Um, yeah. But yeah, there's there's a lot out there. Uh, so just keep looking for it. I think <laughs> I, I wrote the NA, NAHC. Is that what you said? Yeah. Native American Heritage Commission. Yeah. Put that in the in the email that goes out tomorrow. There's also a, um, a, a great app. I, I don't know how accurate it actually is. Like I think it's called Native Land. And you can type in your address and it will tell you, you know, the the indigenous peoples that were in on that address or in that area and then you can do further research from there so um native land somebody turned me on to that and whenever i travel now i always pull up that app and i go okay where am i and like what you know what was here before we all came in and did what we did here 
Um, yeah. No, that's yeah. a great app. Yeah. And I think they're always updating it. So it gets like new links to things. So yeah, that's a really good place to start too. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's going on in the chat and I'm going to send you all this, Martin, and we can talk about mm -hmm. um, this. And if there are answers, we want to get back to folks, but there is one last question, which we will get to, which is from our good friend, Terry. And she would love to hear what your next book is about if you're ready to share it. Oh, okay. Well, and Terry's going to hear pretty soon too, because I got to be on a panel with her talking about my stuff. <laughs> uh, I'm doing, I'm actually working on a couple different book projects, but the, the one uh, I'm co-running a couple things too. Um, one of them is going to be about the Quiro State tribe of the Año Nuevo area uh, and that history. But the, the book that I'm working on, most of my focus is on is, it's a, quite a bit different from this. I'm looking at um, the 1970s, and I'm looking at, um, in particular, there's a um, there was a situation that happened in uh, the Santa Cruz County in Watsonville, where there was an armed confrontation between uh, some Native folks. Uh, there was a burial site that was being developed, uh, and so this is the era of kind of you know red power and American Indian uh, movement activism. And uh, in this particular story, I've been working with some of the people who were there and involved with this and kind of doing an oral history with them, um, but recording their story. Uh, it happened on a place called Lee Road, and there was, again, the SWAT team was brought in, and there was uh, AIM members who were there, it kind of became this big uh, moment. Uh, fortunately, it didn't end with uh, bloodshed, and they're able to find a way to protect the burial site, but it hasn't been talked a lot about. It was called, uh, referred to by Native folks at the time as Wounded Lee. Uh, as kind of a, a nod to Wounded Knee that it happened two years earlier. So I'm looking at that. I'm looking at uh, there's a couple other moments around uh, the Bay where similar type uh, grassroots um, activism by Native peoples to protect burial sites and sacred sites and looking at that and looking at kind of how that shifted things, right? And kind of that was right at the time that helped uh, kind of create the situation where now at archaeological sites, they bring in Native monitors, right? But that was um, kind of a, a result of this type of activism. So I'm looking at how uh, that and I'm trying to uh, interview people because I know a lot of those folks are getting up there, um, but some of them are still around. So I'm kind of focused on doing it as more of an oral history project. Hmm. Well, we'll have to have you back when, yeah. when you got that ready to go and talk to a book club audience about that. That sounds great. Um, yeah. So yeah. so it's about 10, 10 after six now. We'll wrap up. And Martin, I'm just going to say thank you so much for being our speaker tonight. This was great. Um, lots of great comments, lots of positive feedback. I'll, again, I'll share that all with you after, after tonight. But thank you so much. Um, well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you, everyone. And uh, yeah, I think I left my email and stuff. I'm happy. I like talking to people, answering questions. So you know, feel free to to send questions, and happy to talk more. But yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And, and I'll put your contact information in the emails that go out tomorrow, so everybody will be all in your inbox shortly <laughs> after that, and you can you can answer folks. So thanks everyone for attending this book club of California program tonight. Really great to have you all here. Um, our next program is a co-presentation with Litquake. Um, Litquake is back in the month of October. So on Tuesday, October 11th, uh, we will have a co-presentation with Litquake. And yes, it's Tuesday. Usually book club programs are on Monday, but for this Litquake program, it'll be on Tuesday, October 11th. The title for that program is Who Killed Jane Stanford? A Gilded Age take Tale of Murder, Deceit, uh, spirits and the birth of a university. So who killed Jane Stanford? Uh, Tuesday, August, uh, October 11th. And it will feature author Richard White in conversation with Julia Flynn Seiler. So again, Tuesday, October 11th, that's an in-person program here at the book club at six o'clock uh, with Litquake. You can register for that event online at bccbooks.org slash programs or using the link that's in your weekly programs emails that you're probably receiving from the book club. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Uh, be well and take care of yourself. Thank you.